So today we we move on. We 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 have seen some. Uh, uh, so we are doing this electrostatic. Thing. Uh, and uh, uh, essentially, this is described by the subset of uh, Maxwell equations uh, in which we, we have put all the time dependent parts equal to zero. And in that approximation, we know that uh, the curl of the electric field vanishes. And for us, that means that we can write the, the, the electric field itself. Uh, by means of a simpler function that is the, the, the scalar potential. It's simpler because it has only, it's just a scalar while this is a vector. And then uh, uh, the dynamics is given by, by Gauss law, right? That it, it tells us that the divergence of this electric field uh, uh, is, uh, is given by the charge density uh, distributed in space, okay? And uh, so these are Maxwell equations for uh, for the electrostatics. And uh, last time we, we saw how to sort of uh, uh, use Gauss law in, for very simple distributions of charges, uh, but uh, to use the integral form of these equations. Why here you have a, a surface integral, right? And, uh, and uh, the integral over the volume of uh, your charge distribution. And by, by if the charge distribution has a, a, a simple enough geometry, then it's simple to do this integral, right? Essentially, it's some you integrate over some simple surfaces, and then uh, we derive, for instance, what is the electric field uh, uh, about uh, a, 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 an infinitely long uh, uh, wire uh, uniformly charged. Uh, and then uh, I, I left as an exercise to do the same for a spherical shell and, and so on and so forth. And that way, we, you, you re-derive most of the results that uh, you are already familiar from uh, elementary physics, uh, like the, the capacitance of a, of a, of a, of a, of a charge metallic uh, uh, surface, like two, 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 two sheets. Uh, uh, with opposite charges, or in fact, uh, uh, two uh, uh, spherical shells, one inside the other, and so on and so forth. But uh, okay, th those you understand that that was a sort of a, a ad hoc uh, uh, solution. I mean, if the charge distribution was simple enough, then you could uh, sort of do this integral uh, by hand. Uh, by just by inspections and then do the thing. But in general, your charges are not kind enough to, to, to distribute themselves in a simple geometry. You have some charge here, some, some other there. And so you need a more systematic uh, way of solving these equations. And this was, uh, was studied in many details uh, in, the, in the 19th century. And you see that uh, you can uh, 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 take these two equations together I mean, you, you can think of the scalar potential as the fundamental quantity. Uh, it's simpler. It's just a scalar field, so it has only one value, not uh, three like the vector. So uh, if you take this and you plug it in here, right? If you take that uh, and you plug it in, uh, in the uh, divergence, uh, you, you, you get, uh, uh, well, you have a minus sign from this definition. Uh, and so you get this equation. And uh, as you have uh, reviewed your uh, uh, vector calculus, uh, uh, you remember that uh, this object, if you take the divergence over the gradient, this is a new object that usually is, uh, is written like uh, the Nabla square or sometimes like this, depending on, on the book. Uh, but I think I will stick to to the Nabla square. Uh, because it's a square, I don't have to worry about the vector. So uh, I get this equation here. So in a way, this is completely equivalent to Maxwell equations. And uh, is the equations that we are going to study uh, for, for a while. Uh, it, 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 it's so important that, that uh, it has a name. 
presumably from the, well, Poisson was an, one other of these guys, uh, a French guy in the 19th century. Uh, there were all a bunch of uh, mathematicians at the time working on these uh, physical problems, but from the point of view of mathematics, uh, he did a lot of work on, uh, on differential equations like this. Also, uh, you know, the Poisson theorem, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, it's also important to study the closely related equation in which uh, you are in empty space, that you don't have charges, right? So then uh, you simply have zero. And, uh, okay, this is still the Poisson equations, but usually when you see zero here, this is a zero, uh, this is called Laplace equation. Okay, that's just... Uh, if somebody tells you solve the Laplace equation, you know what, what he's asking. Okay. And actually, uh, we, we already know the solution of this, right? We, we already know the, uh, uh, the solution for, for outside some uh, charge distribution because that we, we, we know that the potential at a certain point are in space, right, uh, uh, is given by uh, the integral of the charge density uh, integrated over a certain volume uh, V prime, where this charge is, and then you simply have a Coulomb uh, force, right? We, we already know uh, that, is the, that, that is given by this potential. So in a way, uh, we... Uh, uh, we already know the solution of this equation. So what's, what's the big deal? Why we, well, the, the fact is that you see, this is a, 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 the way we, we did it up to now is that uh, if you give me the charge distribution, then I tell you what the electric field is, okay? But in uh, everyday life, uh, usually that's not the problem. That's not uh, how the problem is, um, uh, not the way the problem arises. Uh, uh, is rather a, a boundary condition problem that you want to find the field in some uh, uh, part of space given some boundaries, for instance, given the, the, the scalar potential of some surfaces, okay? Remember, like we, when we did the, 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 uh, the for instance, the, the capacitor with these two sheets of charges, there, for instance, you may want to find the field inside between these two uh, uh, planes, right? But uh, instead of specifying the charges on these planes, really you, you want to uh, solve the problem, for instance, if you ground this uh, one of these two sheets or both of them. So there you see the problem is not, uh, can, you cannot write the solution in these terms because you, you are not given the charges. Actually, the charges are, are, are going to be part of the solution to find how the charges move. And, uh, and, uh, uh, what you are given is that, for, for instance, you, you have a sphere, a charged sphere, and then you ground this sphere. And then you want to find what is the electric field there. Okay? So these kind of problems are re re actually more common than uh, the, the one I said before. And uh, clearly to solve this, uh, you need something more than this because uh, uh, you're not given the charge here like uh, in the Coulomb problem is in this form. I give you a charge Q here, and then I ask you at point P, what is the electric field? So this is, is completely solved by this. But here, I don't give you the charge. I tell you, for instance, that the potential on this sphere vanishes, vanishes because it's grounded. And then I want to find what is the electric field here. So you see, it's a problem which the, 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 the charges here, they will move in such a way to compensate the field and give zero potential there. So you have to, f you, you put the boundary conditions, then you find the potential and the charge distribution, okay? So that's the most typical framework that uh, you will have to, and unfortunately is more complicated and, uh, uh, well, that's what uh, those thick chapters in your textbook about electrostatics is, is made of. I mean, solutions of this problem, okay? If you go and uh, I hope you already did take the Jackson book from the library, you will see that uh, there are many pages of, of discussing these Poisson equations and then the Laplace equation. We will do, do the uh, sort of light uh, 
discussion because uh, we don't have time to, to uh, also, I mean, uh, it may be not so important. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know, it's always there and uh, you want this, right? Yeah, okay. So that's good because uh, so you, I know that you are following, right? I introduce a little, uh, but again, uh, it's the question about this, uh, this uh, in the Gauss units, uh, you don't have that, but okay, thank you. Of course, if I wrote it like this, you are absolutely right. Uh, I should write that in that form. Um, okay, so uh, 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 for, for, for like w what happened for many interesting problems uh, like this one, you don't have just one solution. You have many way of, uh, of attacking the problem. And we will see essentially, uh, I guess, three ways, but there are even more. Uh, but that's good, right? Because uh, uh, well, we will solve some of these uh, in the in the problem sessions. And uh, uh, as I told you, uh, uh, why we were doing classical mechanics, it's always good for you to have a, a toolbox with many tools, because you never know in your future career what kind of problems you are going to have to solve. And you know, if you have just one tool, okay, it may fit or may fit or may not. Uh, my, if you have many tools, at least you show that you are trying <laughs> more than one thing, uh, and, uh, and one of those uh, uh, may work. Uh, and here is really the, the, the place where most of the tools that uh, we use in modern physics uh, were first uh, 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 dreamed up. I mean, uh, all this uh, differential calculus, I mean, still a lot of physics is made out of of these equations, and this is really is the place where they were first studied, okay? So, uh, so it's also, that's one of the reasons why uh, you're asked to, to know uh, this kind of things, okay? So it's not advanced uh, physics, it's basic physics, uh, but uh, it's done in a, in, a, in a sort of sophisticated way. So, so, as, so that we can teach you some of these tools. Okay, it's like Lagrangian mechanics, analytic uh, mechanics, uh, you learn some of the tools that then you are going to use for more advanced problems. Okay, so uh, after this uh, sort of mot motivational uh, prep talk, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move on. So I, I said that we want to solve the, uh, this equation, yes. Um, uh, for given boundary conditions. And uh, these boundary conditions, you understand, can be of, uh, uh, of, of two kinds, essentially. Uh, you, you either, so I guess, uh, uh, let, let's write them down. Either you specify, now oh, this is wet and, uh, so you, you, you have a specification of the potential Or on, on on the surface of this body, surface of bodies, so the potential, okay? Or you can uh, have the specification of the, uh, of the uh, electric field, right? You have these two options. And uh, what is the electric field? Uh, on, on this, we, we saw that uh, uh, when I discussed the boundary condition, uh, the electric field uh, at the boundary, uh, uh, so on the surface of some uh, body, is the norm, uh, the, no, uh, the, uh, the normal derivatives of the scalar potential. So specification of uh, normal derivative of potential. So here's the potential, here's the normal derivative of the potential, the electric potential on surface of bodies. But this thing is AKA the electric field, okay? And these two, so these are the two possibilities. 
and uh, they, they, they were discussed so often that they got a name. So these boundary conditions are called the Richelet, another this guy, boundary conditions. So if you give the potential, then uh, you are given a Dirichlet boundary condition problem. Like uh, I did before, when I grounded that sphere, I was giving you a Dirichlet. And uh, on, on the other end, if I had told you that the electric field was such and such at the, at the boundary, uh, that is called a no Neumann, 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 I guess, it's the German name, boundary condition. This is very general. I mean, uh, it, it goes beyond uh, the Poisson equations. The terminology uh, stuck and then is used in all problems. If you give uh, the potential at the boundary, you are discussing the Richelieu problem. If you give some derivative at the, a derivative at the boundary, you call it the Neumann problem. I, even if you have a string in mechanics oscillating, if you fix the end point, then you are solving a Richelieu problem. Instead of fixing, you, you impose some value to, to the motion, the velocity, or the end points, you, you give a b Neumann boundary condition problem. So you see, it's just a, it's a general terminology for this kind of differential equations. Okay? So what we now want is the, the equivalent of what I erased here, that was the solution of this equation in which you don't have just the charges, but you have also the terms produced by these boundary conditions. And we are going to have an expression for the potential depending on whether you, you are given the, the, the Richelieu boundary condition or the Neumann boundary conditions, okay? So that's what we are going to do next, if you agree. So now we need some uh, clearly uh, hey. we need to do some uh, uh, gymnastic with this uh, 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 vector calculus in such a way to 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 rewrite uh, the, the the Poisson equation. Uh, the solution to the Poisson equation in the, in the form that, uh, uh, that, the, uh, that uh, we have explicitly these boundary conditions. So, uh, okay, bear with me. We, 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 we start from Gauss' law, right? Uh, remember, uh, Gauss' law was that things that uh, if you have uh, uh, an integral over a volume, uh, uh, the Gauss theorem, okay, not the Gauss law, uh, uh, that links the divergence, we use that to derive uh, uh, the differential form of the Maxwell equation from the integral form. If you, if you, uh, uh, right, if you have the, vo the integral over a volume of a divergence, this is an arbitrary vector A, okay? This is linked to, to the flux of this uh, vector through the surface bounding this volume. So let's, I use this notation. Uh, so the flux, uh, so the normal component of this vector across the surface S. So you have this S, and this is the volume V. And you have some vector A coming out. OK, the, the, you already know that. And uh, uh, so for let, let's, uh, uh, let's take a, a particular case situation in which this vector A uh, is given by a, a, a scalar field like this. I take two scalar fields, phi and psi, and I take the, the gradient of psi, okay? So don't despair. I mean, why I'm doing that, you will see in a second. This is uh, done also in Jackson. I'm following your textbook because uh, so you can find all these steps there as well. 
So if I now take the divergence of this quantity, so I take the divergence of phi gradient of psi, okay, and uh, uh, you know that this comes in and acts on the gradient, so you have a term that is just uh, the nabla square psi, so it's the, this operator, uh, and then you have a term in which this acts on the first one, so you have the, the gradient of phi dot the gradient of psi, right? And uh, um, if I look at this part here, so th this I did the divergence, this part here. If I look at this part, I take the same vector A, and I now I dot, so I have phi gradient psi dot this, uh, the, the norm to the surface, okay? And this, you understand, uh, is just the, the phi, the derivative, since this is the gradient, but you take only the component of the derivative normal to the surface. So this gradient becomes just uh, the, I, I indicate this, in, is, is the partial derivative in the direction n, okay? Th this is dx, dy, dz, but uh, I project out in the direction n. So you have a gradient, you have n, and I take the scalar product, so this, this component along this direction I call d psi dn, and it's this. So now the Gauss, so this is Gauss theorem. For this particular choice that uh, we are going to see in a second why uh, I made it, uh, uh, the Gauss theorem, I, I can replace this on the left-hand side and, and this on the right-hand side, right? So I get uh, the integral over the volume, left-hand side, is this f of phi delta square psi plus the gradient uh, phi dot psi huh? dv, okay? is equal to the uh, uh, surface integral of d uh, phi phi d psi dn ds, okay? Good. And uh, uh, you understand that I can just uh, do exactly the same thing by reversing what I call phi and psi. I can just introduce A, but I put a, a, the psi function here, then I take the gradient of phi. So if this I call it one, I will get exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing, except that I exchange the, the psi with the phi Right, this just stays the same. And this is going to be the integral, the surface integral of psi d phi, so psi d phi dn ds. <coughs> and now if I take uh, 1 minus 2, I take this minus this, you see that you get some simplification because you take this minus this, right? So these two are the same, right? They commute. So I'm left only, these two are not the same. So if I take equation 1, uh, that is essentially Gauss theorem for that particular choice of, of vector field, and I subtract two that was just uh, the other choice of the uh, field. F on the left-hand side, I get the, the integral over the volume of this minus this. So let's write it. Phi d psi minus psi delta 2 phi. Huh? And uh, uh, then I get uh, the difference between these two terms on the other side. So the surface integral of this difference, phi d psi 
orthonormal, uh, ortho ortho orthogonal derivatives uh, of the psi field and then psi minus the same for the phi field ds. Okay, so uh, just to give the, the, the terminology, this is called, uh, again, a, Gauss, uh, a green, this is called first green theorem. So another name, green is the same guy of the green functions that we are going to use. So, so this is the green theorem. I mean, it's not really a theorem because it's just. Uh, and this one is called the, the second green theorem. So green again was the so we are almost there. So that I have used and I don't need it any longer. For this is all wet and it's not very good because when it dries is In fact, since we are talking about green, we, we can stop for a second. Uh, and uh, do you know about the green function? Do, do you or do you, have, have you done that? Okay, so in this case, uh, of the, so the green function in general, if we have the, the Poisson, I need a, a dry section of the blackboard, okay. If say you have the Poisson equation, the green function for this equation in general is uh, 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 okay. It's uh, uh, it, uh, let me use Gauss units, so I, I take the four pi. Right. So the green function for a differential operator, in this case uh, the, the Laplace operator or, or the Poisson. Uh, is that function that gives you the delta function. You remember about the delta function? This is a, a, it's not even a function, but uh, let's call it like this, is a distribution, strictly speaking. Uh, a, and it has the property, right, that uh, say in one, this is in three dimension, but it's the product of one dimensional one, right, dx, dy. And in one dimension, the, this delta function has the property that if you integrate, so this is one dimension, so along the axis, if you integrate this function, uh, x minus a, delta function, if this, uh, in the integration region, you have this point a, it gives you one, right? And it gives you zero otherwise. So it's like, uh, it's a very peak function like this, right? Then you integrate along uh, uh, and, and it gives you one. So you understand that it's not a function because such an object is not a function, it's a distribution. But, uh, well, if, if, I mean, it's, okay. And the other important property that is, in fact, is the one we, we, we use uh, to, so this is like, a, if you know the green function, you essentially have a solution of your problem. Why? Because if you take a function times this delta function, and you integrate, and this uh, a, a point is within your integration interval, this gives you just the value of the function at that point, okay, I, I, you already know that. But you understand that uh, the green function, I, if you know the green function of this operator, then you have solved the Poisson equation, right? Because you see that if you know the green function, then you put it there, you see, and you integrate. And so whatever the, the charge distribution is that you put here, you will get uh, the charge uh, that you have. So I, if you do the integral, then you get uh, so what is the green function uh, of the Poisson uh, equation? So let's back up here. Uh, so what is the solution of this? Well, it's essentially the, 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 the Coulomb potential, right? Because the green function is going to be one over R minus R prime, uh, uh, right? And if I plug it in, 
I get uh, this delta function, and then uh, if I, I've, I've convolute this in uh, with, the, with the charge distribution, I get exactly. But I also, I mean, any function of R and R prime that solves Laplace equation, meaning that delta F is equal to zero, right? It's also, I mean, this is the solution, uh, but I can add uh, to this solution any function that is solution of the Laplace equation because you understand, right? Uh, it doesn't change uh, the fact that this uh, equation is satisfied. In fact, this is the basis, the fact that you have this function or one of the techniques that we are going to use, this image charges solution. Uh, because uh, you manipulate this side here in such a way to uh, uh, adjust your solution to the boundaries. We will see in uh, half an hour. Okay, so uh, after this uh, sort of uh, sidetrack, I, I go back uh, to Green's first and second theorem. And in fact, I pick for psi. So now I, okay, I, I've done this for a generic phi and psi. Now I pick a special choice of, of psi, psi, and phi. Well, phi, as the notation may have uh, suggested, uh, I, I consider phi to be, in fact, the potential, the scalar potential of my problem, okay? And psi, for psi, I take exactly the green function. So psi, I take the green function for the Poisson equation, okay? It's a scalar function, so I take this. And for, for phi, I take just the scalar potential. So by phi, I really mean phi, meaning the scalar potential, the gradient of which is the electric field. So in other words, phi is the potential of my problem. So the, uh, the Laplacian, the delta square of my potential must give me this uh, uh, charge density because of uh, Maxwell equations. If I take these two, then I can, uh, uh, I can uh, rewrite uh, this uh, uh, Green's uh, second theorem, right? Because you see that uh, I have uh, So you, you repeat phi, you put the G here, you put the G, let's see if I, so you get uh, uh, maybe I use this first. Uh, so I have the integral of the volume. Uh, this is the, the plasion of the psi, but for the psi, it took the green function, right? So I get exactly this factor. So I get minus four pi. Phi is whatever phi is. So it's a function of R prime, because I mean, and uh, this is just the four pi delta. I need the, so let's uh, remove this definition. So volume minus four pi phi r prime, then I get a, a delta function because minus four pi the delta function because of the uh, definition of the green function for the Poisson equation, right? So this is the, the, the first term. Then uh, uh, then I get the, the, the green function this, this, the green function that is this uh, one, uh, uh, I get uh, one, so rho r prime, right, because of this, uh, divide by epsilon naught, and here I have this r minus r prime. I can call this big R, 
is the distance between uh, uh, these two points, okay? And this is all integrated over the volume. And this one is equal to that surface integral so that, I, that I wrote here. That is equal to what? Phi, phi is phi. Then I, you take the derivative of uh, respect to n. Well, this is really uh, n prime, right? Because it's the derivative with, well, it depends how you call it. Let's call it n. Um, <laughs> of, uh, of this psi that is 1 over 1 over, so I call big R, so this I call it 1 over big R, so 1 over big R, so that is. And then I have 1 over big R, the derivative uh, of the potential in the direction N. This is integrated over S. So you you're still with me or? Yes? Yeah. You see where I'm, uh, we are almost there because you see now I, uh, I have this has to be equal to that, okay? And, and you see that uh, you can, uh, for instance, thi this part here, you can do the integral right away, right? Because of this property of the delta function. So you are left with the, with the, with the, the potential, not in R prime, but in R because of the delta function right, is equal, bring everything on the other side. So you have this term here, this term here. Well, this term here, you divide by 4 pi, so it's 1 over 4 pi, epsilon naught, the integral of rho over uh, rho of r times the, 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 the green function. This is the green function. Uh, Huh? I, I take this on the other side, and then I, I have this, and then these two terms. So I wrote the first two terms. This is just a green function, right? So, and you recognize this, this, if you put the green function, like in here, this is just the usual term, is the, the one we wrote, so that's fine. It's the integral over a certain volume of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, but I get the two extra pieces that are going to give, to give me the, the contribution of the, on, on the boundaries, right, that are these two. So I have to add to this uh, <coughs> 1 over 4 pi, 1 over 4 pi, the integral over S, so these two. Um, so I, I have to change the sign, so they switch. So first I write the green function, that is this d phi dn minus phi dn, the green function. So it's just these two terms switched around because I took it on the other side, ds. Now, this is the solution of the Poisson equation, okay? Uh, this is the, the usual term, the one we wrote before, right? You all agree? And I have two extra pieces that you see they depend on the boundary conditions because they are integral on these surfaces. And you see that uh, depending on whether I take, so what is the, 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 the uh, accordingly to uh, if I consider a Dirichlet problem rather than a Neumann problem, I have different contribution, right? Because you see, if I have a, a Dirichlet problem, that is, I give uh, the, the potential phi, phi on the surface, I, I retain this term. And instead, if I give the derivative of the potential, I take this. So this is the Dirichlet. And this is the Neumann. Neumann term. So in other words, if you want to take the Dirichlet solution, 
you have to take the, the, the as a green function, so the green function of the problem, as you see, they depend also on this term. Eh? So the Dirichlet green is such that on the surface it vanishes, okay, the Dirichlet one. So that this term goes away and you are left with the terms that is determined by the potential under, okay. On the other hand, if you want to get rid of, uh, I mean, if you want to study the Neumann problem, then uh, you, have, you have to take this term and therefore you have to specify what is the, the DG Neumann right uh, at, the, at the border. Now, one would think that uh, if you take this equal to zero, that's the solution, as we did here. But this doesn't work. Uh, uh, it doesn't work because you can check, but we are not going to. Uh, this does not satisfy Gauss law. It doesn't satisfy Maxwell equation. So you have to change this a little bit. And the solution that is usually given is that this is equal to this, OK? where S is the, is the area of the surface. So if you pick, if you decide that your green function, I think I have, the, I have this tail that, it's like a dog, it has always to remember where the tail is. <laughs> um, so you pick your green function for your problem according to this prescription, and you get uh, our result that uh, I, I mean rewrite it in, a, in all its glory, that if you have the Richelieu, so the, the, the potential that is a solution of a Poisson equation with the Richelieu boundary condition is given. This term is always there, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught the integral of, the, of your uh, charge distributions uh, times, al now this I take for my green function, the Dirichlet green function, that is the one that satisfies the Richelieu boundary conditions, okay? And then uh, uh, only this term, because I've taken uh, those, uh, 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 my green function is such that uh, on the surface it vanishes, so this term is not there. So I got just get minus 1 over 4 pi, this integral of the surface, phi r prime, then that is derivative of my green function orthogonal to the surface, ds. Hmm? And uh, vice versa, uh, if, so this is a Dirichlet. And vice versa, uh, if, uh, if I am studying a Neumann problem, well, the first term is always there, except that now I have a Neumann green functions. And, uh, 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 but now this one is gone, so I have the other term, so it's one over four pi with a plus now, and you have now the derivative of your potential, and then times the Neumann uh, green function. So this is Neumann. So now you think uh, this is really awful that we are going to discuss this and find solutions, but uh, uh, okay, the, the first I appreciate this is the general solution of the problem, so uh, I mean, it's, a, it's quite a result. Uh, it's the equivalent of what we wrote for the single charges, right? Given those charges, it was just this first term. Uh, and now you generalize that solution of the Poisson equations uh, in which uh, you, you are given the charges and then some boundary terms either the Richelieu or Neumanns, and this is the solution of the problem, okay? It's the solution if you plug it in. So if, if, if I give you this charge distribution, the value of the potential on some surfaces bounding your problem, 
uh, then uh, you plug in in those equations and, and you have found your general solution. So we have solved the Poisson equation. So now, in practice, what, what, what are you going to do? Well, if you have your nice computer, then uh, you just ask the computer to, to, to you plug in the, the charge distributions, the value at the borders. Then the computer uh, knows how to do this numerically, so you get the potential and, and so on and so forth. But of course, uh, uh, the various Laplace, Poisson, and Greens, they didn't have a computer. Uh, and uh, so uh, they developed various techniques to, to solve these equations without numerically integrating them. And you see that, OK, let, let's uh, discuss the first uh, of these techniques. Uh, uh, the hint here, you see, uh, when I write uh, G Neumann or Dirichlet, what I mean is that I'm modifying my green function by using this, uh, this term, right, in such a way that uh, 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 the boundary conditions are, are satisfied, okay? And so, uh, for instance, uh, when I consider the the Richelieu green function means that uh, I, I adjust this uh, extra function in such a way that this function uh, on the surface vanishes, right? So you have this term, but on the surface you subtract something here in such a way that the green function vanishes. So you see the trick is uh, to find this function f in a way, in such a way to get the green function satisfy your boundary conditions because then the solution is is, is simple, it's simply given by these uh, uh, two integrals. Now, how do you do that? Uh, okay, you can do it uh, numerically, but uh, uh, you know, when you don't have a computer, you, you, you have to be clever. Uh, and uh, at the time, uh, so that's why they were much cleverer than we are now, because they didn't have all these computers, I guess. But uh, uh, you, you may almost guess, how do you change this uh, uh, this f this uh, these things. Uh, uh, any idea? You see, uh, take a, take a, a charge Q here, and then uh, you are given this problem. This is a kind of typical problem. Uh, you have a point charge in front of an infinitely uh, an infinite plane a conductor, and uh, uh, this one, it has zero potential. That's a typical problem. If you open Jackson, you go to the exercises, this is the first problem you find. So how do you solve that? Okay, uh, if I take, uh, yeah? By the major maintenance. Did you all know about that or not? Did you hear what he said? <laughs> First, <laughs> he said you solve it with uh, this uh, by putting some image charges that is a, a fictitious charge somewhere in such a way that the boundary condition is. Uh, but you see, this is exactly this is correct, uh, and uh, you see the the image charge is the one that produces this extra field, this extra component into the green function in such a way that is because if you take the the, the potential here of this single charge, right? Let, let's call it phi tilde because it's not the real potential that we are. This is just what? It's one over four pi epsilon, I guess, epsilon naught, one over uh, r. But you see, this potential s does not satisfy the fact that it's zero on this plane because this is just a Coulomb potential and it just goes this way and presumably you have an equipotential surface there, you remember that we draw that, and no way that is going to satisfy that. So this is not the solution. This is this, is this part of the solution. is the green function in empty space, if you want. So you have to modify this green function by adding something here in such a way that the combined green function indeed vanishes on the surface, okay, so that you get the Dirichlet this is a Dirichlet problem, right? Because I give you the potential, not the derivative of the potential 
that is the electric field, so that this is satisfied. And as he suggested, one way that you can try uh, to do that, uh, so let, let's. Uh, is that uh, somewhere, uh, let me draw this a little better. So uh, you have uh, your conductor and is grounded, okay? And you have your charge Q here. And what you want is that uh, uh, the potential here uh, has a fixed value, in particular zero. And uh, so what happens if you add the charge here with the opposite sign? You see, now the potential is not this phi tilde, is phi is given by this phi tilde of your charge plus some uh, new, I don't know, phi Higgs, uh, some, some name, uh, 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 that is just the other charge. And you know how that is. We are back to is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R minus Q over R prime. So in, in an arbitrary point R, you have the superposition, right, because we, we decided that, uh, uh, so this is R prime, and this is R. So if you call R the distance from your original charge to the point P, and R prime this, and uh, did, uh, uh, mm. Okay, and all you you have to do right is to uh, so you put this uh, at the distance well because of the symmetry of the of the problem uh, you put that uh, at the distance a from the and uh, to solve uh, this you, you you have to require require that uh, this, uh, uh, this, this potential here, when r is equal to r prime, right, when you are on here, is the constant value of the potential that we said we can take it equal to zero. Is this clear? It's very clever if you, uh, because you see, before you had this uh, force line going like this, but because you have two charges, and you, rem you, you may remember, that, I mean, the force line goes like this, something like this. And in fact, what happened that uh, here in the middle, you have the potential uh, uh, vanishing. So that's very simple because of the symmetry. But the idea is general. I mean, if you can find a set of extra charges, I mean, this charge does not exist. In fact, this part of the space, this part of the space is outside your problem because this is the boundary condition. So this, the part, the, fr the fraction of space you are interested in is just uh, on, the, on this uh, uh, right-hand side. So this is the space you are considering. Then here there is a big cut because you have this infinitely large uh, uh, sheet of, of, of metal that happen to, to be a, a zero potential, okay? So here you can really put whatever you, you want because nobody is going to, to check whether there is really a charge here or not, okay? But the idea of solving this problem is that in a way you remove the, this, uh, this uh, sheet of metal and you study the entire space, and in the part of the space that is beyond your boundary condition, you can put as many charges as you want in such a way that uh, the, the, the green function vanishes, uh, in this case, uh, uh, at the boundary condition as required by this Dirichlet uh, condition, okay? So this is technique is, the, is called the method of images. 
images. For obvious reason. Have you already seen that? Okay, you did. How many of you already solved some problems using this technique? You are the only one. Ah, two, three, okay. Okay, but I mean, it's a. So it's a way of finding this green function in, in the language of, uh, of, uh, that we have uh, introduced. This is a way of, of solving, of finding the green function. It's a clever way without having to do any numerical study. I, if you are clever enough to find the appropriate uh, charges to put in the problems in such a way that you produce the, the, the desired boundary condition, then you are done because this is, is the solution. This is tells you that uh, this distance is the same, and in fact, also the value of the charge is the same. So you take a charge of exactly the same amount, you put it symmetrically on the other side, and you have solved the problem. Okay, so this was trivial. Let's try something less trivial by using the same technique. And the next level, uh, I mean, of complication uh, in this is maybe, well, there is a, a choice, but. Ooh, ah. So after you after you find this this term, is it okay? Is it the one that you already that's used? Yeah, that's the potential. Oh, you already solve it. There you have the potential that already solved. That's already this potential here. Of course, when you know the potential, you also know the green function because essentially the green function is the potential in which you vary the. So this is already the complete solution. I mean, I ask you, what is the potential in this half of the space for a single charge and a sheet, uh, a metallic sheet with a given uh, potential? And that's the solution. So you don't have to worry about this. You, you already have the solution. But you can rephrase it because you have found the green function that vanishes on that surface, so you, you can rephrase it in this term. So I guess the next uh, level of uh, is uh, uh, so I don't know whether to do this as an exercise or <coughs> or ah yes okay so let me so uh, homework number I don't know. So this we, we discuss it on Monday. Uh, so I, I compute the potential. So please, uh, in fact, uh, uh, check uh, what is the, uh, for, for the problem, for the previous problem, so single charge with the, find what is the electric field uh, on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on the boundary. Hmm? So you only have a normal component, so uh, at the boundary. Well, you have the potential, so you just take a derivative, you change sign, and you get uh, your potential. And then by using Gauss law, so one, two, by using Gauss law, <coughs> compute uh, the, the density of charge on this, uh, on, on, on the boundary, you understand the presence of this charge induces some uh, density of charge on this plane, and then you integrate this, uh, so three, integrate this density of charge to, in fact, find what is the total value of that density of charge, the, wh what is the total amount of, of induced the charges on that plane. So that's the homework. And uh, so uh, so here we had, a, a, a before we had a, a charge Q in the presence of, a, a, of a, an infinite plane conductor, okay? 
And now I want a charge in the presence of a spherical conductor. Uh, uh, that uh, 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 again, uh, it's grounded. So again, the, the if this the, the radius, r r r the, uh, let's call it a. So phi in on the radius is zero. Is it clear? Yes, ah? The last point? Yeah. So you, you compute E, then you use Gauss law to, 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 to compute sigma, then integrate sigma along the, the, the plane to find what is the total charge on the plane. So total charge on boundary. Well, you already know because uh, the total charge must be exactly the charge or the image charge that you have put. So you already know that this integral must be minus q. But uh, you have to check. And also it's nice because you see that the image charge in a center way is uh, the charge that you have uh, put on the boundary because of the presence of your charge. Here is the same. Instead of having uh, this uh, infinite plane conductor, you have a finite spherical conductor of radius A. Again, uh, you put uh, the, you fix the, it's a Dirichlet problem, you fix the potential on the boundary, that is this conductor, and let's pick uh, uh, the value zero for this fixed value. Uh, and uh, uh, you want to solve uh, the, the problem. So again, this could be an exercise or, well, let, let's, uh, let's begin here, then we finished in the problem section. So that's like. So how, how, how would you? So how would you proceed? Still with the same technique. So the idea here is that you, 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 the, the, your, the space where you want to find the solution is everywhere except inside the sphere, right? Because the, the surface of this sphere is your boundary. And the other boundary is the infinity. Okay, so you want to find the potential everywhere except inside the, the so the, the, the trick with these uh, uh, images, these fake, fake charges that you put, uh, you cannot put a fake charge here because uh, then it would not be fake, right? Because uh, here you, you, you can go and look. But you cannot go inside the sphere because that's the boundary of your universe. So the, the fake charge has better be outside where you can look. So like uh, with a plane, you had to put it on the left-hand side right, not on the right side, because if you put it here, you are changing the problem. It's not any longer the potential of a single charge outside the sphere, it's the potential of two charges outside. Uh, okay, that's an interesting problem, but it's not the problem we want to solve. So, uh, uh, <coughs> let's call this, uh, uh, I guess I call it X vector. It's a vector, but I call it x. And uh, a generic point, I call it x because a generic point, I want to call it r because of a long-standing tradition. And you understand that uh, the, the new charge, let's call it q prime, has, has to be inside here, right? Because you don't want, and because of the symmetry, I guess, I don't know, but my guess is that has to li lie on the line going from the center of the sphere to this new, to this your external charge. So let's call it Q prime and put it there. What I don't know is how big this charge should be and how far from the center should, should be, right? This, unfortunately, I cannot do it by, by symmetry or, or thing. I just have to write the potential. Now the total potential 
due to these two charges as before. So what is this? The total potential here in arbitrary points R is going to be the sum of the potential due to this. So it's the Coulomb potential of this plus the Coulomb potential of the other guy. So one is Q. So what is potential there is R, right, minus this X that I introduced, right? Because this is the, right? And, but I also have my uh, uh, images, uh, my, my, this fake charge that I introduced. So I add, I don't know even the sign I, I, at this stage, but you, you may guess what the sign should be, but let's not assume anything. And, and this is the other, so maybe I should call it, I think I call it, uh, so I call A the radius, so X prime, I guess, is a reasonable choice. So it's R minus X prime. Hmm? So that's the potential, that's the solution of my problem. But I have to impose that this potential, so the boundary condition, for this Dirichlet uh, problem is that when R is equal to A, this ra radius A, uh, uh, this, okay, must vanish. It's very neat, I mean, very neat. So, well, so uh, I, I write this. Uh, Right. Let, let me write it in a, in a simpler way. I guess I did this. I pull out. I pull out uh, this. Uh, so I'm I'm putting uh, uh, R is equal to A. So let me pull out this A. So I have A. So A is the length of this vector. And you see, you have one minus what uh, 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 x over this A, bless you. And here I pull out, uh, uh, I guess, uh, X prime. And I have one minus A uh, X prime. And this must vanish, must, must vanish, right? And you see that <coughs> in order for this to vanish, uh, this, uh, Right? You should have Q over A equal, well, here you have a plus, so it better be minus Q prime over this X prime. And at the same time, X over uh, A, X over A must be equal to A over X prime. Therefore, uh, Q prime, so the, the, the size of this fake charge, I, I get it from there, right? I, I solve these two simple equations, right, to find what is Q prime and what is X prime. So Q prime is just minus this X prime, uh, Q divided by A, and X prime is just, you see, a square, a square divided by uh, x. So if I take a charge, a fake charge Q prime with that size, okay, and I put it at the distance, the, the radius square divided by, by the distance of, of my real charge, I put it here, then uh, by construction, my potential on this surface vanishes exactly, okay? And I've solved my problem because now I have a potential. So I, you take Q prime, you put it here, X prime, you put it here, and this potential 
okay, is, uh, is a potential that uh, describe, uh, uh, gives you the electric field everywhere outside the sphere, and in particular, it has zero value on the sphere. Wonderful, no? You don't seem too excited. I don't blame you. <laughs> Just to make it more interesting, uh, then do the same here. So you have the potential, so please compute the electric field. The electric field, again, the, 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 the electric field on the, on the surface compute the density of charge, do the integral, and verify indeed that uh, when you do the integral, you get this Q prime charge that is the one we found uh, in the... Huh? This is just the same stuff for the other problem. Now, if, if, if you like this, if you keep go going so uh, you can try two more problems that all simple problem that can be solved by the use of this uh, technique this method of yes yeah no. Mirror. Yeah, I mean, you can think of, uh, Finish your sentence. Okay. But there are many ways to solving this problem, no doubt. This is one technique. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's concave this way, yeah. it's convex the other way. For the force line. Yeah. But you have to impose that what? Uh, you, but then you, you need to know the E field here. So that's a Neumann problem. Solving without calculating the electric field or something. Yeah, but uh, I mean, if you are saying something about the, the force line, you are saying something about the electric field. So then uh, you have to fix the electric field here, but here you fix the potential. So w maybe your technique is good for the Neumann problem, not for the Dirichlet. Of course, they are related uh, because, in fact, I ask you, given this potential, to, to compute the electric field. But you see, the electric field is not bounded. I, I don't fix the value of the electric field. I fix the value of the potential. But okay, so I mean, uh, you, you can solve it. Any problem? I mean, you know, there are many ways to to skin a cat. If you have a good way, I mean, you are welcome. But okay, here it's a it's a okay. Go ahead. But uh, so. Um, So if you, if you uh, I mean, the weekend is going to be very cold and, and it's going to snow. So I guess you, you will have a lot of time to, to practice this technique. So I give you two more problems. Probably we won't have time to, to, to solve them together, but uh, you can also, I mean, it's, good, it's a good exercise. Uh, uh, so a conducting sphere. So again, you take a conducting sphere, so a conducting well, I should move on. A, a conducting sphere, like before, but uh, you put it into a uniform electric field. In a uniform electric field. And, and you want to compute the potential. And the other one, is a variation of this one that we have just solved, 
that you have your conducting sphere, you have an external charge, but this time, instead of grounding the sphere, I fix the potential on the surface. So instead of being zero, I just take an arbitrary value. Let's call it V. So the potential on the radius is just a value. And so this is, uh, again, very similar to the previous one, but instead of, of getting, so again, you, you put a ch fake charge somewhere, but instead of vanishing the potential there, you get the constant term, so you, you have to reshuffle. So I guess this is very simple. This is a little more, it requires a little bit of, of work. So since we don't have much time, uh, I'll stop here about the, this uh, technique. Uh, so uh, just to summarize, uh, so we are solving the Poisson equations. As I, we, we wrote the general solution of the Poisson equation for uh, Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. Then uh, we, we, we look for techniques to solve the problem. And this is the first one, maybe the simplest one. Uh, uh, to, to, that you can try. Of course, it's not the most powerful one because you understand, I mean, uh, if the problem becomes too complicated, you are not going to find, you know, you, you start adding charges, but at a certain point you lose track of all this stuff. So what they did uh, was to, uh, to, uh, to do something uh, more powerful and as I already said, but uh, probably we won't have time really to to go into that. Uh, maybe we, we do it in this. Uh, Another possibility is, uh, as I said last time, is uh, uh, these were problem in three dimensions. Sometimes your problem is simpler because it's just a two-dimensional problem, right? Usually stuff becomes simpler if you reduce the number of space time, uh, uh, the, uh, the number of space dimensions. Um, in particular, if you are in two dimensions, uh, you understand that uh, uh, the, uh, you remember you, what you have studied uh, for analytic functions. So analytic functions live uh, naturally in two dimensions because they are made of complex numbers. And you know that a way to visualize complex numbers is uh, to put them on a plane in which you have the real axis and the imaginary axis and then point on that plane on this blackboard. Uh, so if this is the real axis and this is the imaginary axis, then points there are uh, complex numbers. And then the function that lives there is, uh, is, is a complex function. And uh, you remember that, uh, so a complex function of a complex variable, uh, I call it uh, the real part plus the imaginary part, right? Is that the notation you, you have used? Yeah. And uh, this function, if this function is analytic, is analytic, that is, it behaves nicely everywhere, you remember that it satisfies a, a set of conditions that are called Cauchy-Riemann. And uh, uh, I guess they are like this, that the, the, the partial derivative of the real part with respect to, to the x, so z is x plus y, okay, x and y. So you have this cross uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, equations that uh, uh, right? If uh, this is an analytic function, then the real and imaginary part, they satisfy this uh, Cauchy-Riemann condition. But you immediately see that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, if, you, if you take the, the derivative of this with respect to, uh, right, to, to, to x and y, you get that uh, d2u dx square must be equal to d2y dy square. And, and similarly, d2v dx square must be minus d square v dy square, right? Just by crossing twice. But this looks very much, you, you remember the, 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 the Laplace equation, for instance, right? Uh, 
uh, is exactly in this form, right? Because it was something equal to zero. This operator is d square, dx square, right, plus d2, dy square, d2, dz square. And you see that uh, if you take uh, the value here, right, you, you immediately get that d2 dx square plus d2 dy square of, uh, sorry, here is uh, uh, of uh, u. And similarly, d2 dx square plus uh, d2 dy square of the imaginary part of that function must vanish. Therefore, you see, this is exactly the two-dimensional Laplace operator. So you forget about this. You are in two dimensions. Therefore, the two-dimensional, I guess, d equal to uh, Laplace operator of this function z uh, satisfy Laplace, uh, Laplace equation in two dimensions. So this observation that, by, by the way, connects to seemingly unrelated subjects, right? Because the Laplace equation popped out from the Maxwell equations. And here we are discussing a completely different problem, that is the analytic properties of functions in two dimensions, or complex functions. But they happen to be related. And therefore, uh, uh, you can always solve a two-dimensional problem uh, uh, of electrostatics if you find an analytic function satisfying those given boundary conditions. So that's the second way. Uh, uh, and this goes, uh, so you, uh, is uh, analytic functions as solution of uh, the La Laplace equations, OK? So that's very powerful because, uh, uh, as you probably know, I mean, uh, we know a lot about analytic functions. But of course, it has uh, very serious, serious limitations that it only works in two dimensions. Uh, and clearly, we are not in two dimensions. But so I mean, uh, I'm not going to, to really, I, I just wanted to mention this technique because uh, it's important. Uh, uh, we can study many, many, many examples. Uh, uh, let me just uh, add a few, few words about what, what this technique uh, is about. Uh, uh, so, it's an, uh, so we apply this in two dimensions. And for instance, let's consider the Dirichlet problem. So what does it mean? That we, we are in two dimensions, right? So, uh, uh, so this is y and this is x. Uh, and we think that as a complex plane. And it's a Dirichlet problem. So for instance, I fix, I fix uh, the, the u function, this, uh, this uh, u component, uh, I, I will say in a second what, what is v, uh, this uh, u uh, uh, x of y on this, uh, on this uh, is equal to c1 here and uh, is equal to a c2, another constant, for instance, there. So you see, this is the, 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 the framing of a Dirichlet problem in two dimensions. And uh, you want to find the field right uh, in between this. And uh, this, uh, this result, based on the Cauchy-Riemann relations, is that if you find an analytic function satisfying this boundary condition, you have solved that problem. So uh, actually, all the information is here because uh, uh, So in other words, if this is the analytic function uh, satisfying that, you see that uh, this u is what uh, is going to be your scalar potential. And what is v? Well, you understand that, uh, first of all, if you take the gradient of u and you dot it into the gradient of v, this is always 0 because of this property. So there are two scalar fields the gradient of which uh, uh, is always uh, uh, orthogonal to each other, OK? This is easy to prove, right?
by using this, right? Because d u d, so I take the gradient of this, so it's d u x d u y, and I dot into this, so I get d u x d v x, right? Plus d u y d v y. But you see that the d u if you want, dVy is equal dUx minus dVx is equal duy. So you see these things vanishes. Therefore, this is always true. So that means that uh, uh, your lines here, right, this is the, v f the, v the scalar field. V is usually called a uh, stream function. Because the gradient is always pointing, uh, is always orthogonal to this, and uh, uh, you really see that uh, uh, it describes the, the, the field that is uh, uh, orthogonal to the gradient of u. And what is the gradient of u? Well, u is this potential, so this has to be the electric field, right? In fact, if you take the derivative of this analytic function with respect to z, meaning du dx plus i dv dx, right? Then you use that is du d, uh, let's say, minus i du dy. So I'm using this. Uh, you see that uh, this, is, this is the derivative in the direction x. So this is the x component of the electric field minus, actually there is a minus because it's minus, what I, a, and this is the y component of the electric field. Okay, so if you want, this is the, it's called the complex potential F, that is the solution of the, and then uh, the electric field comes from the derivative with respect to x and y of the scalar potential that is u. V is sort of helps you in drawing this force line. So, okay, one could uh, then uh, start uh, and uh, crank in and solve a lot of these two-dimensional problems, but uh, we, we don't really want to do that. Uh, maybe if you, f again, over the weekend feel very bored, you can try this. Th this is the simplest potential that you can solve. Find the potential for a charge wire. In a way, we already solved this problem. But uh, and you understand, this is a two-dimensional, not, the, the, not because it's really two-dimensional, but because this is an infinitely long wire. So you can uh, put yourself in cylindrical coordinates and for any x uh, by symmetry should be the same. So really the problem lives in two dimensions, the two dimensions that are orthogonal to the wire. Okay, so that's the way two dimensional problems uh, are produced in electrostatics because uh, it's not that they are really two dimensional, it's simply that one of the dimensions is uninteresting, nothing changes in that direction. So, uh, so with then uh, we will discuss the solution, maybe on Monday. So I guess I, I, I uh, well, I wanted to do also the third technique, but I'm running out of time. So we do that uh, on uh, on Wednesday, and uh, the third technique, uh, what, what could that be? Uh, well, a, a systematic study of the Laplace equations, right? Uh, you want to systematically study this equation, right? And uh, how do you do a systematic study? You have to write uh, a set of differential equations uh, uh, that you know how to solve, and th those are not that many, and they depend on the coordinates. And according to the coordinates in which you write the, your problem, and obviously, you pick the coordinates for which the boundaries conditions are simpler. If you have uh, squares uh, and planes boundary conditions, uh, it's a good idea to use Cartesian coordinates. If you have spherical uh, boundary conditions like the sphere we had before, you, you should put, pick 
uh, spherical coordinates, uh, cylindrical coordinates, if you have uh, hollow cylinders and all the, you know, just like in mechanics, you pick your coordinates in such a way that uh, the symmetry of the problem is uh, emphasized. Then, uh, once you pick the coordinates, you can try and, and write, the, solve this equation. But you see, these are differential equations with partial derivatives. And you remember how difficult they are uh, from the Hamilton-Jacobi stuff, right? If you still remember that, uh, that you were very grateful that there was no part in the problems in the finals about that, because they are different, difficult equations. And you remember that the, the trick is that uh, single components should uh, uh, decouple, right? In such a way that the partial derivatives can be written as a total derivative. And this is exactly what we'll do. Separation of variables in different system of uh, coordinates in such a way that we know how to solve this equation. And this will lead, this is actually historically led to those special functions because this, the differential equation arising from here are all those equations giving rise to the Lagrange polynomial, Bessel functions, uh, all the, you name it, and, and it, there it is. So we will stick just to, to I think, just to, to uh, uh, Cartesian and spherical coordinates, but I want to write this operator in these two set of coordinates and, and write the general solution in terms of uh, Legendre and spherical harmonics, right? Uh, because that allows us then to expand the generic potential on these functions, okay? And that will lead to the final thing that we want to show, that uh, this expansion in monopole, dipole, quadrupoles, that is useful in the applications. Okay, questions? If not, uh, Yeah, by using, I, I want you to write the analytic function that uh, solves this problem. So, again, you can solve it in many ways. We already solved this problem using Gauss theorem, right, in a way. But I want you to use this. Uh, it's the simplest case uh, that I found. So that, but you, you go, it's in the book, so I mean. I mean, everything is in the books. It's not that I'm making this stuff up, right? No, oh, yeah. It's like the, you know, those teachers, they say, this is not in the books. <laughs> That's impossible. I mean, <laughs> everything in the books. So if you, if you need inspiration, go read, find, and solve. Okay.